what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is SPTV. Hey there, everyone. This is Mike Rinda back with Claire Headley and our very special guest, Mike Brown. Um, nobody probably other than ex Sea Org members from the Int base know who Mike is. Uh, he grew up really at the Int Ranch. He was a Sea Org member. Uh, he grew up with, with my children, actually, at the Int Ranch. And he eventually escaped the Sea Org in 2003. He joined the Army. He did, what, three tours of duty in Iran and Afghanistan? Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, three, uh, three in Afghanistan and then two in Iraq. Oh, so five. Five. Wow. And he is a, be busy. Yeah. a helicopter pilot and a helicopter instructor now in the army. His uh, he is here as sort of a surrogate for his mother. His mother's name is Rosemary. Well, we all knew her as Rosemary Brown, uh, Mike Brown, Rosemary Brown. Her her maiden name is Rosemary Chickwalk, and she is the subject of this uh of this youtube video tonight because the story of what happened to her is not only horrifying uh and and grotesque it is also a story of uh that illustrates <laughs> the treatment of Sea Org members, particularly elderly Sea Org members, um, not just in Los Angeles, but in Clearwater, at the Int base, anywhere where there is a Sea Org installation. Um, and it is also a story of hope. I know <laughs> we're going to break this into two parts because there is so much to cover. And this first part, we are going to sort of tell you really about the abuses. And then uh, we're going to take a break and then be back on Thursday to tell you about the aftermath of the abuses and the Aftermath Foundation and the role that, that the foundation played in this uh, saga and what has happened subsequently. But I, I just want to forewarn you that this is going to make you as sick as it makes everybody who hears this story. It is, it is beyond comprehension that this sort of thing is going on in the United States. I will also tell you that Mike and his mother have reported every detail, like every single detail to law enforcement. This is not just someone out there yakking saying this is what happens he went to law enforcement rosemary spoke with law enforcement the only reason that rosemary isn't here talking to us tonight on this video is honestly i don't want to put her through the trauma of having to recount her experiences yet again i she is 77 years old she is not in the greatest of health at this point She's doing fine, but I, I just I feel it would be it would be torture to do that. And Mike is the one who actually stepped in and came to her rescue. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's no other real way of putting it. He came to her rescue, found out all of what was going on, and took action. And um, everybody should be should be wishing that they had a son like Mike. For so, sure. <laughs> no, it's very and nice the reason of you to say that I appreciate it. And the and the reason that Claire and I have been involved in this, uh, or are doing this video in particular, is because uh, Mike knew both of us when we were at the Int base, and Mike reached out to us when he needed help at the sort of outset of discovering what was really going on. So we have had sort of a. A, a relationship moving down the path of getting from, oh my God, this is going on to where we are today. So that's a, a sort of a long winded introduction. I'm sorry about that. I just wanted to set the stage so everybody knows 
who Mike is and why we have him talking about this subject, because he has been intimately involved and directly involved and personally involved and experienced and seen this stuff. And with that, unless Claire, you have something else, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and let him sort of fill us in and we'll, we'll add bits and pieces as we see fit, but. Yep, I'll only add in summary, yes, this is an incredibly heartbreaking story of the criminal abuses of Scientology. Just keep in mind as you listen to it that there's a happy ending, so. <laughs> yeah, this, yes, is, ultimately. this is definitely a, bi a big story. I'm going to try to do the very best I can uh, to cover this as chronologically as possible and um, kind of filling in. There's a lot of information on what I assumed at the time. Uh, coming out of Scientology when I was, I left uh, the int base when I was 27. And uh, at that time, um, I left, uh, I, I knew all of you very, very well. Mike was, you know, sort of like kind of friend's dad is probably how the relationship I would say would be there. And yeah. Claire would have been like, if I was a junior in high school, her and Mark would have been like, you know, the, uh, the seniors in high school in terms of our age bracketing, <laughs> but I worked a lot with Mark and, uh, in gold and, uh, there's a lot of stories there to talk about, but I don't really want to get too deeply into that. The one thing that I think is important to go over is that when I left, uh, things like the aftermath foundation did not exist. Um, as Claire has uh, gone over in great detail, like when those of us who left, I left actually in, uh, October 17th of 2003. So in a couple of weeks from now, it'll actually be my 20 year anniversary of um, blowing Scientology. Nice. And when I left, I was able to reconnect with my family on the outside. Um, but everyone that I knew in the Sea Org, all of my friends, um, my former wife, everyone I left uh, and no one was able to either come with me or stay in contact with me. So leaving at that time, um, I had a GED. Um, I had about 20 bucks in my pocket and that's about it. I had some skills that I had learned in the Sea Org, but that wasn't very much. So when I left, I had fallen out of contact with my mother and only occasionally saw her over the course of pretty much the next 18 years uh, on or off if she so happened to be visiting uh, her family. And I would try to scoot out there and see her and try not to you know, make waves for her. But um, one thing to also go over is there's definitely going to be some, uh, trigger warning things, uh, that are, we should, uh, kind of, um, make clear to everybody. I'm going to try to stay as, uh, YouTube appropriate as possible, but there are things that are, we're going to get into obviously elder abuse, elder financial abuse. There's going to be abuse of a sexual nature. There's going to be workplace violence. Those are the things that um, probably people are used to and seeing these videos, but there's going to be a lot of it here. And I'll try to cover it as succinctly as possible. Um, so kind of focusing on my mother, um, she joined the Sea Org and I'm going to kind of go to the point of where everyone would have known her more or less when she was working in the Sea Org. She came as a very green Scientologist and very early on, uh, after we moved to California, um, she started the Estates Project Force, which is the kind of boot camp for Sea Org members. That, there was a lot of new things there for her. She had done auditing, um, probably up to about grade four, but had not touched a bit of courses and technical training. And uh, auditing at that point, it actually went quite fast for her. I think it was probably within the course of less than a year she was up to grade four, but still Scientology as a subject overall was very, very new. She was maybe in Scientology uh, about three years before that, the reason we joined the C organization was because she got recruited after um, she had gone through a divorce with my father. And she was then a single mother trying to figure out what to do with a kid. So I figure I'm, I'm going to do a lot of talking, so I'm going to have to take some <laughs> sips every once in a while. It's totally OK, Mike. <laughs> Er, so er, this um, is very this is very casual. Just so you know, er, no, I, I understand. Nobody who's watching this is worried about you know making mistakes or saying the wrong thing or drinking. Oh, your that's good because I'm going to hook it up or... at some point. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, looking at her view 
like from her point of view back then, she was thinking very much she was getting into a church group. I can remember she had two friends. One was uh, in a Christian group that was called the Navigators. It's sort of a Protestant uh, sect of uh, Christianity. And then she was already involved in Scientology because my father had gotten involved in it, got her involved in it. And then they just were on in the Scientology kick when they went through a divorce. So she was working as part time staff. Uh, she got recruited um, by uh, a recruitment event come that came from CMO International, which is one of the more senior management organizations in Scientology. So we we sold all of our worldly belongings. Um, I'm sure a lot of that just got like flushed down the toilet in a divorce. And then we moved uh, with a couple bags uh, to um, California. She went to the pack base originally and she went through the EPF. I think the EPF probably took her the better part of five or six months. And then during this time, it was kind of shell shock for me. I was thrown into the pack cadet org where um, I kind of had to learn big new words like study tech and FO38 and things that I had no clue about. Um, and it was, uh, it was very strange. I was also living with another family sleeping on a mattress on the floor in their living room. Uh, it was, uh, Yolanda Avila with her two sons, Jorge and Felipe hmm. and Jorge and I are still good friends. I don't know what Felipe is doing, but, um, yeah. And, and then shortly after that, she graduated, she wasn't qualified to, um, go into CMO because the Commodore's messenger organization, you have to have a little bit more of a believable production record to qualify for the organization initially. And she just didn't have that being more green into Scientology. So she got traded to the marketing unit, which was the central marketing unit at the time. It was down in uh, LA in the uh, big blue building on Fountain. And uh, that was around the time that, you know, Jeff Hawkins has talked about it a lot. The Dianetics campaign was big. It was, you know, all of the, all of the, all of the ads on TV. So she was assigned there as, you know, just a brand new Sea Org member. And rank wise, she was uh, what was uh, referred to as a swamper, which is the lowest rank in Scientology. You're basically like a new private in the military. Um, you have no experience and you're just like that new person on the block. She goes in there and she's in the uh, HR department and she was then um, within a couple weeks or even sooner assigned to uh, be the secretary. I think it was referred to as the communicator, but it's kind of the same function. It's basically a secretary, personal assistant, communicator. They just have different words for stuff. But uh, for Ronnie Miscavige, which uh, Ronnie Miscavige Jr., so it's David Miscavige's older brother by a couple years. And, um, and so she started working for him. And uh, that's when I became very good friends with um, like Justin sterling um i met you know taryn at the time so because rosemary was working for ronnie she was taking care of not only office duties but those communicator functions are largely connected to um personal service or personal assistant level uh things uh whether they should be or shouldn't be that's how they're usually used i refer to as a, a facility differential meaning i'm going to help you with everything so that you the organization can work you as much as possible yeah um so she worked um, for Ronnie, um, was um, instrumental in taking care of his children. And with that, that's why we all kind of uh, went in the same friend group. Um, at some point, uh, the organization was being restructured so that central marketing was actually being moved up to the international base, which is the Gilman Hot Springs uh, Golden Air Productions property in uh San Bernardino, uh, Riverside County area. And with that, Rosemary was supposed to go up there. Ronnie got a promotion from CMU as the commanding officer to become marketing executive international. And that's one of the upper, upper level, um, management organizations under it's, it's like one step down from the watchdog committee. You then have the, uh, the executive, uh, the, under the executive director international, you have all these marketing executives. Their function is they have different functions based off of Scientology needs. He was in charge of marketing. There might be another one in charge of books. So it's all these different functional areas of Scientology. Their job is to kind of do analysis of the statistics and come up with programs in order to expand those um, different sectors or not really sectors, but functions into the different sectors. It's all smoke and mirror Scientology stuff. 
So <clears throat> Ronnie goes up there. Rosemary gets the rent clearances. By this time, I guess she had had enough experience to qualify for the upper level organization. She went up there and um, I stayed in L.A. I, I kind of ended up in another family's floor um, kind of as and this was typical. Like I remember Taryn and, and Benjamin were down there, Justin and Sterling, Jenna and Jenna must have been like five or six years old. I'm, we're talking like kindergarten level. But um, there were there was either, uh, you know, nannies that were watching us or with us in the cadet org. We were kind of like free range. We were supposed to go to the cadet org. Most of the time we were just running around L.A. Anyway. Um, at some point, um, we ended up getting moved up um, to the cadet org. I have, you know, that's a whole nother story that I can get into. I'm not really going to waste everybody's time with that now. But Rosemary continued working for Ronnie. Um, and along with that, the other exec internationals for the better part of 10 or 11 years. Um, she was kind of a fixture in exec strata. She worked what was funny was not all of the exec ints, which is what they were referred to, like the marketing exec ent, books exec ent, but Ronnie was the marketing exec ent. Not all of them had assistants um, or communicators. Uh, it was only some. And Ronnie was definitely one. And it became very evident at um, and at an, a point early in uh, Rosemary's career that being connected with Ronnie had um, kind of its perks and that he got a lot of attention. And with that, um, a lot of extra allowances were made because of his last name. But then at the same time, she kind of was, you know, on the other double edge of that sword is um, it seemed like a Miscavige can almost do no wrong in that organization. And I know that <clears throat> that's it's tr probably true to so, uh, some degree. I know that Ronnie and Biddy uh, at some point ended up leaving. And Dave's kind of the last man standing in terms of anyone in his family there. But um, he was definitely afforded a lot more luxuries than the typical executive, even at the WDC level. Um, so Rosemary would usually kind of be the surrogate assistant for a lot of the other executives. Um, I, I'm, even when they would go to the ship, I'm sure, Mike, you you ran into Rosemary frequently when you'd go to the free ones for the maiden voyage event. She would be there doing everyone's laundry, getting everything ready. Yep. I think you possibly had another assistant because of your level of uh, importance, but not many did. So the, you know, the Sherry Murphy's and uh, probably even, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Guillaume had it, you know, like Sam Powell work for him or something. But yeah. a lot of times Rosemary would be taking care of like 10 of them at once. So she right. was a fixture in that organization for a very, very long time. Um, and for for Ronnie would really take care of his household needs, um, you know, kind of take care of the kids. She would go out and get us from the ranch. Um take people to doctor's appointments, um, like round up the kids, bring us home, which would usually also be Benjamin Taron. I would be the tag along. Uh, I've always, I like to refer to uh, the families in Scientology between like the Miscavige's and the Hubbard's and stuff. It's almost like that, uh, the HBO show, A Game of Thrones. Like it's that complicated. <laughs> yeah. So I consider myself like, and that's Scientology royalty. Like that's how it feels to me. So I'm kind of like royalty adjacent. I'm kind of like your Hodor kind of person. Um, so <laughs> anyway. That's a great analogy. That's a good description. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just happy to be here. Um, so anyway, what, what wasn't really known or seen um, that started from a very early time when Rosemary was working for Ronnie is Ronnie um, would was and this is this is strong language for me to use and people might disagree with our analysis of it but I'm just going to kind of put it out there but more or less Ronnie was slowly grooming Rosemary and taking advantage of her in a way that was very inappropriate in any sort of workplace Scientology or otherwise so things that uh, would be unacceptable in any corporate setting or even in a Scientology setting, Ronnie was doing and was getting away with. Uh, things uh, of this were like things um, would be like this is this was this was awkward. This is awkward to talk about, but it was even more awkward to try to help my mother be able to get through what happened and be able to explain it because she ended up. Uh, getting the brunt of a lot of what I'm about to uh, describe. Things that started out as back rubs eventually escalated to the point uh, that they became um, workplace violence in a sexual nature. 
So it wasn't, it didn't, wouldn't be things that would go to, you know, complete assault, but it would be things that people would absolutely be relieved for in a cor corporate setting. So those back rubs, you know, would then turn into body massages. Uh, and then, you know, that quickly turned into other things in terms of inappropriate touching. Um, I'll kind of just leave it at that, but I think that kind of paints a picture. And this was happening, it, it started early and then it escalated over the years. Um, and, and, uh, and I had, I asked Rosemary and I'll, I refer to her as Rosemary, which is a strange, uh, thing that I think is very much a Sea Org thing. Like when I'm talking to her doctors and I'm like, Hey, I need to get, you know, some prescriptions for Rosemary. They'll be like, why aren't you saying mom? And I'm like, because I want you to know I'm talking about Rosemary. Um, and they're like, that's just odd anyway. So, but, um, but when we were talking about these things and she was trying to get out, I'm like, what was, what was it like for you? What were, what was your minds, uh, where was your head at with all of this happening? And she was like, I, I felt like I was stuck between two impossible situations. I have this happening on one end. I know if I report it, I'm going to get in trouble because what did I do to pull it in? Then also, if I say something, he's a miscavige and more than likely I'm going to get in trouble and I don't know what would happen. And ultimately, <clears throat> she then had a child, me, that was dependent on my existence in Scientology and out at the Ant Ranch and then in Golden Era Productions. She then didn't want to lose her ability to take care of me or have us thrown out of the organization. So she didn't know what to do with this. So as a result of not knowing what to do, she was stuck in a situation of being able to do nothing. Um, eventually something happened where Ronnie was in trouble and RTC started to investigate this. The investigating team, um, was, I think, headed up by Marty Rathman. This is probably around, um, 1998, uh, early 99 timeframe. Yep. And at that time, I believe Claire, you were in RTC. Yep. I and, was. Uh, so I was witness to, um, the victim shaming that Rosemary suffered that you're go going to describe. But yes, I witnessed these events firsthand as well. So when this was found out, Ronnie was pulled in for security checking. He was investigated. And then also, which is typical for victims in Scientology, the other person involved is pulled into a security check. This is not sitting down with HR. This is not sitting down with a counselor. Uh, where you're like, hey, we found out this was happening with you. We'd like to get, you know, we'd like to provide you a victim advocate. This is none of those things. So in um, in any normal work environment, there is a reporting mechanism for workplace violence and sexual abuse. That doesn't exist in the Sea Org. Like if you re report something in the Sea Org, you're in the same amount of trouble no matter if it happened to you or if you were the person that was instigating it. So she was sec checked and um, she was having to describe all of what was going on. And the sec checker was really trying to be like, you know, we're, weren't you interested in this? Didn't you want this? Whether she did or she didn't is almost immaterial. You have somebody who would be a commander, like three bars with somebody that's a very junior Sea Org member and also has direct authority over them and is one of the most senior executives in Scientology. This was around the time that Ronnie was involved in part of the, you know, the event circuit. Like he'd be one of the speakers every once in a while. He wasn't frequent. Like Mike would be all the time, but Ronnie was like, I don't know, a couple, two, three times maybe, but he was, he was a big wig. Um, so when this happened, um, Rosemary was, uh, isolated to the property, sent over to the old Gilman house and, uh, made which to is where, which is labor. where the people who are, are severe considered to be severe security threats or are uh, saying that they want to leave the sea organization are isolated from the rest of the sea org members at the international base so that they can't contaminate them right absolutely and <clears throat> and also like one of the main things is you're a flight risk is if you're in any sort of trouble and i know that there's been a lot of talk like jackson's really gone over the whole blow drill well the the first preventative measure so somebody doesn't blow is you take away their freedoms to leave the property Right. right. So that that take that that in and itself is like, oh, we don't want somebody to leave. Let's just make it so they can't. You don't have a cell phone. There's not you don't have any real connection with your external family. 
It's the, um, there's big big you're, you're fences stuck. and just oh, yeah. a two lane road to nowhere. And <laughs> and cameras and cameras everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah camera and, razor and wire. I mean, security guards and but, the security uh, guards actually even slept. Yeah, the security guards even will, slept out there. And I will honestly say that the, watch. Yeah. the the level of security, like during deployments, that level of security is what we would have on like bases where we're like trying to keep everyone safe before you go out and do operations. That's the kind of level of security that would exist in the, the this compound and at most of the compounds. Um, whether it's visible or not, that is the way that it goes. Even on the in the Hollywood property, they have that level of least of you know, visual security. And most of the time the staff are just running around inside like ants. Anyway, I'll get into that in a little bit. But um, so Rosemary is now in trouble uh, for what happened. Ultimately, I think Ronnie got into a little bit of trouble. I think uh, he might have been subjected to Jenny Linson possibly cutting off his commander stripes. And then he was sent back to work. Hmm. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rosemary's uh, restricted to OGH. Um, and, well, I will say anytime anyone has to actually deal with Jenny Linson, I would rather deploy in another combat deployment than to like interact with that woman. She's a terrorist. Anyway, yep. so. Agreed. Uh, so Rosemary's over there not knowing what her future is going to hold, but. At the same time, like, are you really going to like, what are you going to do with her? Like you sent Ronnie back to work. So she's just sort of in limbo. At one, at some point, um, Steve Willett, who at this point was the CEO gold rolls up and asks and told, tells Rosemary, Hey, I need a housekeeper for the G units, um, which were the, the, uh, VIP apartments that they have on the property on the South side that would be used for, um, celebrities that are coming up. Uh, either for RTC or for cinematography, they might have the the professional stay there. I know that um, Mitch was uh, a kind of a frequent resident there. Danny Sherman um, was there, and Rosemary went into that job for about the next four and a half to five years, working at the G units as a housekeeper, which really consisted of everything that you would expect, expect in a luxury apartment, from you know cleaning to bed turned down service to making sure that you know uh, food is available like they're kind of there as like anything that would be needed that's what they're there for and she stayed in that position until um 2004. <clears throat> she did great i will say one thing about my mother she is one of the hardest working most dedicated um individuals you'll ever meet she just you know, she loves taking care of people. And so the service related jobs were something that she fit very well into because she's very selfless in her giving to other people. It makes her happy to make other people happy. Yeah. Can, so, we, can she, we take a is, minute and pop up her picture, Mike? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'll, absolutely. I'll give you one from when she was in the Sea Org here. Yeah. Yeah. There so this go. was uh, this would be the Rosemary Brown that uh, everyone would have known. Um, and this is was taken at one of the maiden voyages. Uh, after I'm sure all the events and stuff were done or, you know, they would have the uh, photographers run around and take pictures of the crew and, you know, give them photos. And this is one right. that she had there. Uh, and she's and, there as MEI secretary taking care of everybody. Yeah. And I've got to add having uh, look, I had a lot of interaction with Rosemary for a for a long time, partly because Ronnie and Biddy and Kathy and I always shared an apartment. We had like those dual apartments, two bedrooms and one central thing. And we were always together. We had an apartment together in Los Angeles, one at the Int Base. We, mm -hmm. like our kids grew up together. Taryn and Justin and Sterling were similar ages and Jenna and, and Benjamin are similar ages. So they grew up together. So when Biddy or Ronnie would have the kids around, like, Benjamin and Taryn were, and, and the Miscavige children were sort of one family almost because we oh, all yeah. lived together. We were all in the 100%. same location. We'd all been together since like Taryn and Justin and Sterling were all born in Clearwater at the same hospital, mm -hmm. basically around the same time and went e everywhere together. So Absolutely. Rosemary was someone that I interacted with a lot. And I've got to say, she is perhaps the sweetest person I have ever met in my entire life. 
Like she's pretty great. She she is just a sweet, sweet, kind, gentle, um, empathetic character that is very, very rare in the Sea Organization. Like very rare. Yeah. You just you just don't find many people like that, and that is Rosemary. You you will never find anyone who has known or worked with Rosemary that doesn't have that same reaction. She Absolutely. is just the sweetest, nicest, kindest, most caring person that you could possibly imagine. So carry on, Mike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I We're getting to the bad can... shit soon. Yeah. We haven't yeah, heard. We, yeah. yeah, we've just scratched the surface to start yeah. to pick at it now. So, yeah. so, um, so now she's successfully working down there. She's on when, which, which is what's funny. They, they, she was busted out of this one position of responsibility to a degree. I mean, she was a, she was an executive assistant and she was put down into gold's, uh, one of gold's uh, service lines. That's so closely connected to RTC and their secrets and their professionals and all the people that they would have coming there that meant the most to the property, there were external people coming in, they would stay at those G units. Yeah, and, uh, and, she would and also... let's not forget the most famous example of that. I know this was before Rosemary was working there, but that's where Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman stayed mm -hmm. when they were at that property in the early 90s. So for context, Absolutely. yeah. They're nice. I mean, they're basically little one or two bedroom apartments. I mean, they're very nicely appointed. It's luxurious. Right. So... <clears throat> So she stays there. And I will say at this point, I was um, I had had, you know, I graduated from the Ant Ranch and I have to do a whole nother video, which I'm going to probably do with Aaron talking about my time at the Ant Ranch, because there's a lot to talk about there and I'm not even going to get into it. But I ended up at Golden Air Productions. Um, I was in a position which is referred to as the organizing officer for the command uh, for the um, the commander or they call him a CO there, the commanding officer. But and then I had fallen into a position which was called the battle plan IC. And what that is, is it's the put person that was put into each one of the groups or each one of the organizations on the int base that would be responsible for running around and executing David Miscavige's orders in that organization. So we weren't in RTC, but we would receive the orders and we'd be chasing up on them like, what are you going to do to get it done? It was like I'm um, trying to spread the frantic and make sure that people know that the order that I told them yesterday has been superseded by the new order and it's a bunch of like back and forth. Yeah. And, and not to <clears throat> get off topic off Rosemary's story, but yeah, pause yeah. to let that sink in for a moment. There was a dedicated person in each organization whose sole responsibility was to get David Miscavige's orders done in that organization. Okay. Back to, Rosemary. I was that guy. <laughs> I was that guy. I was when the, when the job was first created, I was that guy in golden air productions. Yep. And then at, I then got promoted to uh, the training pool for Religious Technology Center. So I became a trainee for RTC and was replaced by another gentleman named Nathan Story, who was there for a very long time. Yes. Um, <clears throat> he probably still is. Uh, so when I, I was an RTC trainee, I have a cool Shelly story at some point that I'll share with Claire at an, another time. But at some point, um, I ended up getting kicked out of the RTC trainee pool. And I ended up down in um, manufacturing and was making the e-meters. I was in charge of the plastics and I was doing that for many years. And then I got involved in the printing uh, lines. And if, if there's anybody out there that's ever been in a Scientology organization that sees that dictionary that's attached to a podium that they can flip the pages and they can see all the different stuff. Once John Horwich made that dictionary, I then printed and produced those and sent them out to all the orgs. And I'm pretty sure that's like the only dictionary that they still have in circulation. Yeah. I think the and tech dictionary and the admin dictionaries. <laughs> right. Well, we printed it. We printed it. Book. So we printed it on this never tear paper. It's the stuff that's like indestructible. It's like Tyvex. Right. This, anyway. And we printed it on that, drilled the holes in it in the OT print shop or got somebody to. I got Paul Schobel to do it. And then we attached them to these like podiums and then connected them the same way they connect the OT course material. So you can't get the pages out. So right. then we sent one to every single org and then people like huddle around this thing, trying to figure out what abstract crap Ron's talking about in whatever lecture it is. So <clears throat> I did that. And then, um, 
here, get into a little um, bad juju with my story. I was married to uh, a girl named Samantha, um, Samantha Silcock. Um, her, her father was actually John Travolta's auditor for a very long time. And then um, her father and her mother, Stephanie, ended up moving up to the end base. And uh, Sam and I met when we were at the ranch. We were both at the end ranch. We got uh, married when we were very, very too young to do it. Very similar to Mark and Claire. Um, I probably was just barely 18. She was um, still 16, about to turn 17. And we had gotten married that young. And during the time we were married, on two occasions, Samantha got pregnant. And on two occasions, she had to terminate the pregnancy in a very similar situation to the other stories that have been told that that is just it was the normal thing at the end base to do that the, your options were well it was it's very unclear with the end base i know that for other lower c organizations they would send people off to have their kid to a class five org but there are also advices from l ron hubbard that said if you ever left int you're supposed to be declared a suppressive person so if you're sent away from it because you're having a kid, it's like this gray zone of like, are you going to get declared if you have a kid? Are you going to lose everything that you, you know, have ever known and loved? Um, it's another impossible situation. So, um, and, and not to mention the fact that they wouldn't let you, I mean, we, we yeah, that is a, I wasn't really our choice. I mean, <laughs> you're pressured not. into, I was, I was, uh, had been involved with or seen, um, other friends of mine that they, like there was a couple, we were RTC trainees together. Um, uh, I'm not going to mention their names because it's, it's their story, but <clears throat> they got pregnant and they were restricted to OGH and being basically worked on, um, meaning like interrogated or talked to, or had, you know, being convinced every single day until finally Greg Wellhair comes down and convinces them that this is the right thing to do. And they go get, um, the procedure and then get sent to work in golden air productions after that, because I mean, they got pregnant. It's horrible. So yeah, it's criminal, which is so strange from a religious perspective because like all of these other religions are like, have kids, you know, we need more people in the religion and Scientology, at least in the Sea Org. Um, they don't want that. And then for public Scientologists, they want to recruit their kids, which then makes them a Sea Org member to not have kids. It seems like it's, it seems it's going to downward trend one way or the other. I, I, I don't know. Dave, Dave doesn't like kids. I think that's been established already, but yep, yeah. thoroughly. <clears throat> anyway, um, the only reason I was still staying there and the living and working conditions at gold were absolutely horrible. And there I could spend dozens of hours talking about specifics on that. And at some point I will. Um, but at one point, Samantha comes to me and she's in tears because she had had a bad run in with Dave and he yelled at her. She was a makeup artist i think she still actually is either in gold or probably down in la now and uh she, she he yelled at her because um the haircut stylist that they have uh driven up from la had him wash his hair and he didn't think he had to by the time he came down and the guy ended up doing it for him and then he screamed at samantha about it she comes home one day and says i want out of here i want to leave i want to blow and i'm like let's get the fuck out of here <laughs> so um and I'm like, hey, we can get out of here. I, I wanted to leave and I wanted to join the military when I was a young kid. I can still do it. Let's go. And she looked at me. Her family is very deep into Scientology. Rena Weinberg, who's, you know, the person over Abel is her um, her mother's cousin. Like her family's nothing but Scientologists. She looked at me and she said, if we leave, I'm going to come back and we're going to get divorced. And that was her reality, which was very, very different than mine. So um, I blew uh, I was out for a print job and I just, I left. I was, uh, I just, it was, it was a very spur of the moment decision. I have actually, I have an actual goldenrod uh, copy of my um, SP declare. We'll have to go over it sometime. So I have my F SP bracelet on too. Yay. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I like to refer job, to myself Mike. as SP as SP number 12595 because that's my flag conditions order. So, um, and I'm I'm really anyway. sorry your wife was not smart enough or strong enough to go with you, but everything happens for a reason, and you're here today. So thank you for that. I am. It, it's it's ultimately we're going to get to a good place. It might take us a little bit of time, but I'll I'll try to move this story along. Yeah. Anyway, I blew in late uh, 2003, and then in 2004, 
there was a clean out going out on the base. Like Dave, I guess, was kicking out all of the people he didn't like. Um, I think this is a time when I, I think the they were either being sent to the RPF or offloaded. And my mother just came up on the list. She was working her ass off as a G's housekeeper. And one fine day, she is going to go home and she's told by security to get out of the vehicle. Like over 100 people were put in buses, taken out to that Happy Valley property, which is the cast, old Castile Canyon School slash Ranch. It's the property on the other side of the Sobobian, Soboba Indian Reservation. They were all being told they're gotten rid of. They um, all of their personal belongings were brought out there. She was um, originally being told that she was going to be uh, offloaded. And at this point, she had no connection to any family. She had no money. She had no nothing. And also very much in her mind was of the mindset of like, she, and she was like, why am I being offloaded? She's like, well, th you're being offloaded because of out 2D with Ronnie. Oh, my um, God. You, <laughs> like the thing from five years ago. So she begged to stay. She's like, I will do anything. Like I've dedicated myself to this and I'm being thrown out like garbage. So she was, uh, they decided to send her to the RPF in pack. <clears throat> uh, before they did that, they went through all of her personal belongings and any photos that they had of me, because I had at this point blown um, the year prior. And I was at this, I was declared a suppressive person. And, um, she was made to round up all these things and hand them to somebody and whichever it was, I don't know which RTC person was out there with them. They were, it was a RTC team and a legal team. I'm sure Kirsten Cantano was out there, but all of her photos of me all the way back to my baby pictures, like, you know, like just irreplaceable stuff. They threw them all in a big bonfire. They just burnt them. Anything that would remind her of me, they burnt. So this is that systematic reprogramming of someone's thoughts and you know what the things that they hold dear and their information like taking it away from them and just discarding it it's like we'll let you stay but you're going to have to basically disavow any past love that you ever had with a family member it was kind of like i'm, I'm trying to even rationalize the programming mindset of whatever they're trying to do yeah they no, did that no need to rationalize it was plain pure it's, evil it's Who just evil it's that? like so there was one little picture of me and this person was like you can keep this one. So she wow. had one little picture of me left and that, the rest of them like went into the bonfire. They had OSA uh, lawyers come out, sat down with her and, um, and they had, you know, this is when they had security guards. They were just rolling everybody through, making them sign NDAs. Like we will not talk about anything about what has ever happened to us. We will not sue Scientology, all these, all this bullshit. They were sitting there with security guards as they're having their stuff burned and they're isolated from everything out there for days at OGH. And then they were, sh then she was shipped down to the RPF and pack. Okay. And, and sorry, <clears throat> just for context, what, how old is Rosemary by this point? At this point, she would have been 59 years old. Okay. And so the RPF, you know, for, for anybody who may not know though, probably most people watching this already know what the RPF is, but it is the rehabilitation project force. The, thought reform program used for Sea Org members to bring them back into obedient compliance with the wishes of the Sea Organization and their bosses in the Sea Org. Yeah, a brutal program, both physically and mentally, um, that isolates you even within the already isolated world yep. of the Sea Organization. Yeah, yep. like they and during this time, they had sent hundreds of people from Ant down to pack. And in, in those SP, uh, sorry, in the uh, the spy files that Mark has, when you start looking at this, they actually ran into a problem of like, now we have all these people down here. So we took all of the people from Ant and now they're all disaffected and run around pack. And what are we going to do? We're going to kick them out now. This The problem persisted over the years. But anyway, Rosemary is now in the RPF. She goes down there in 2004 in the RPF and she stays on that RPF and does not actually graduate it until uh, early 2011. So she's on it for like almost six and a half years. Wow. And during this time, she's gone like she's she's little like Rosemary is probably 90 pounds soaking wet with her boots on. And now she's, you know, living in these overcrowded rooms, running everywhere, eating substandard food, um, cleaning asbestos out of the bridge warehouse, painting all the sets and props for the events with no respirator on like just 
just the heaviest labor that you can imagine they would have them, these RPFers do. And she was then twinned up with a couple other girls there, uh, one of which, uh, you remember Vicky, uh, Vicky Farrell, Vicky Yo, Vicky Cheney? Yes. Yeah, yes. a couple last names. Yes. So that was her twin on the RPF. So um, her and Vicky were twinned. She was also on the uh, RPF with uh, Adrian Amberon. Um, her actual maiden name is Pavlov. Yes. Um, both Vicky, Adrian, and Rosemary were all forced to change their last names. Everyone still had the last names of either their their former spouse or uh, a family member. Like my mom had kept Brown when, she, even though she had uh, divorced my father because she wanted to be connected to me. But that connects her to a suppressive person, obviously. So they're forced while on the RPF to change their names. Wow. Like they brought it like in the paperwork and they would send it out. She said it was a huge pain in the ass. It's hard to change your name when you have like if you're out in the real world, let alone when you're like under lock and key at that uh, pack complex building. Right. So during the time she's going through all this, the main thing that she was being sec checked on again, she's on the RPF because of out to do with Ronnie Miscavige for six fucking years. And I can tell you like, the living conditions in the RPF are so much worse than anything that I can possibly imagine. And, and I know we had talked about me being in the military and I can, and, and uh, I'll just kind of throw in as a disclaimer, this is me speaking as a private citizen about what I'm, what the truth is in terms of my life and what my mother has been through. And, you know, the department of defense takes no responsibility for my, you know, blah, blah. So, um, Anyway, the Understood. blah, 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 anything no, noted. Yeah. Blah, and blah, that. blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anything that the only, the only thing worse might be some very extreme training that the military member might have to go through in order to go through a qualification, like some advanced, you know, war fighting skills, like special forces training or, you know, survival training or something like that. That's about how bad the RPF is but you live there for six years and this other kind of training ends in like a month. So, you know, you can do anything for a short period of time, but factually, if you're abused enough, you can do anything for pretty much as long as they make you do it. Um, and over that time she was conditioned. All the questions were about like, how is she going to disavow? She's constantly in, you know, in, um, grief, um, tears and crying about, having to disconnect from me. She misses me. You know, what is she going to do about it? And they're trying to get her to, you know, give that up and sec checking her about what she did with Ronnie and her bad feelings against Dave and all this sort of stuff. And that's what the RPF was for six years for. Her. And, so, and factor horrible. in too, she'd already had no contact with you for mm. what, four or five years before that. So You'd been now, she'd been completely cut off from any family outside of Scientology, made to disconnect from you going on what, like, at this point, like 12, 13, 14 years? So at this point, when she graduates the RPF, I had probably been gone uh, because I left in 2003. So she gets off the RPF, it's now 2011. Okay. So it's, it's basically about seven years. And okay. she has Got been it. out of contact with everybody, including her family. So... She, while she was on the RPF, started to experience a lot of shortness of breath, um, chest pain, which she was having angina, which is really, it's a, a condition of your heart where if it's not treated medically, you know, it's, you're having little mini heart attacks is what was happening. She's on the RPF struggling to keep up, like holding onto the wall while everyone's running past her being told to hurry up slacker. You got to keep going. She's just kind of, so at this point, she's like in her, in her mid sixties and finally graduates. The, the process to graduate the RPF, and I still have all of her liability formulas. Um, she kept all these things of the sending them up on all the things she did in order to get out of there. It takes like six months because all of those folders have to go all the way up to Ant, get approved all the way through senior CSN, and then go up to RTC for you to be like let off the RPF once you get your liability formula back from gold, which is one of their ethics conditions to repent and let people like let you back in. Right. Very much again, like Game of Thrones where you're walking the street. So um, <clears throat> anyway, she gets done with that, graduates the RPF. And obviously uh, a 65 year old woman that's having chest pain that's going untreated. What are they going to put her as is the the main galley cleaner. So she oh. would clean up after the thousands of people that would go through the main mess to eat from pack, pushing around a mop bucket and stuff. So at one point, uh, this is in September of 2011, she has a heart attack. And, um, 
is rush to first uh, Cedar Cyanide Hospital, which is right across the street from um, PAC. And then <clears throat> they wouldn't take her because the insurance wasn't going to cover it. She had already signed up for Medicare. Um, so she was getting Medi Medicare, but she had no supplemental uh, insurance. So she wasn't getting Medi-Cal at this point. So uh, they then ended up moving her to LA County Hospital, which I mean, it's county hospital. It's not super great, but they were able to get her in. They would accept the insurance that she had, and they then put her through a triple bypass surgery. I was in Afghanistan at the time, and I found out about it through one of uh, her brothers and sisters. Um, got a message to me. My chain of command released me. I was able to do the planes, trains, and automobiles thing and get back the day after her surgery. Wow. Um, she was there accompanied by uh, Adrian Amberon Pavlov um, the entire time I was there. And Miriam Powell and Mike Sutter were trying to like get me in again, the mic now and the mic back then I left gold, joined the military and never looked back. So when I like found myself back in LA, it was, it was almost unbelievably hard to, um, stay away from the, like the programming that had been put in when I was a kid of like, well, what would LRH say? So I'm, I was trying to like, Hey, can I make nice with you people? Because I'd really like to be here for my mother and be able to talk to her. She's going through a lot. And they wanted me to do all my, um, the anti-suppressive person steps that they have my A to E steps. And I'm like, okay, well I look, I don't, I don't want any problem with you. You really don't want any, like you want, don't want to have anything to do with me because I'm in the military and Scientology shit scared of everything that has to do with government of the military. So like, Let's just be, let's be nice with each other. And that's all I was trying to do. Anyway, it's a waste of time. Don't ever do that. It's not going to work. Um, <laughs> but it was going back and forth. Um, she, I was able to be with her a couple days while she was in the hospital. Insurance paid for her to go to a rehab, uh, like a post-operative rehab facility for about 19 days. So she would have professional nursing care. Um, because they did the whole thing, crack open your sternum. Now she's trying to recover. So I, I went and got regular like clothes for her to wear that would be appropriate for all this and got got those things for her. And I also get slipped in a burner phone, um, just one of those little prepaid phones. And I gave it to her and had my number programmed in there so she could call me. Brilliant, Mike. Brilliant. <clears throat> yeah, for a bit. And then it got found out. So okay. um, I then had to go back um, to duty. I wasn't able to stay in California. I had no resources um, or nor did she even want to necessarily leave. And also at the same time, I was still very much in my mind about how can I sort stuff out with Scientology so that I can talk to her because I don't want to have anything to do with them. It's a very, it's very confusing for people to first leave and they manipulate you big time. This is when there was a big cleanup project going there. The, and then they had all the little spies that were probably messing around with you, um, Claire, like the yep. Wolfie Franks of the world who was writing me bullshit emails that I now know that he was just an, an OSA spy. Yeah. So. The Eric Spieslers of the world. Yep. We had plenty of them. We had more, Eric more Spies OSA spies than we had actual friends yeah. back then. Sadly, Eric, Eric, yeah. I'm disappointed Eric in you. Yep. You, you know better, Eric. Anyway. So the, the problem she had at this point, so now we're going to get into some of what, what, what the abuse, what transpired after I left. And I found out, I found out this information more recently um, and actually was able to piece together what I'm now going to describe. So after she, after the money ran out for that rehab facility, she was still not in a good position to be able to come back and live in the main building complex in a dorm. They, they moved her back in there. They moved her into a, a room up on the seventh floor the room had no heat. And this is in November. And it was very cold in that room. She was in there by herself and was infrequently checked on and even infrequently brought food. The food that she was brought had to be brought by her old elderly roommates. It was like they'd bring her like a little cup with some eggs in it. Or if they'd remember, they'd try to bring her some food. But you're now talking about an elderly Seorg member trying to take care of another elderly Seorg member to get food during mealtime, take it up to her before they have to go back to work. It's not like these people have time off. They work them literally until they die. Mm -hmm. um, she described this as like being in hell. She was just in bed suffering. Her, um, She didn't have pain medication. She was just suffering and dying and cold. And the, there was an MLO assistant that would check on her every once in a while, a guy named John Bond. And John uh, worked with Adrian and would come and check on her every once in a while. And 
mentioned to her, he's like, well, I'm starting to get some auditing. John was an old dude too. And she's like, how are you getting auditing? Realize, remember how I said that this many, many moons ago, like 25 years earlier, Rosemary was grade four. She yes. has moved not a single inch on the bridge to total freedom in the entire time she's been in the C organization. Not Typical a Typical of SEAL she's, members. Right. Yeah, just literally working. So she's gone for like 20, over 20 years and moved not at all, except for sec checking and whatever bullshit they put each other through on the RPF. So um, he's like, well, um, I was able to get some, I started getting social security payments and uh, I was able to pay for some auditing at ASHO. And um, uh, maybe we can work that out for you too. She was now, my mom was now 65 and it started receiving social security payments. And she had a wee little pension from before she was in the, um, the Sea Org, uh, because she worked for, uh, a subsidiary of AT&T. And so she had like a couple hundred dollars pension. So as a result, when you don't use your money, it starts to accumulate. And she had a, she had a few, like few thousand dollars sitting there. So two things were happening. One, she was then, because she had a little bit of money in her account, she didn't qualify for the additional healthcare insurance provided by the state of California. So FP, financial planning in the Sea Org, should have covered her copay uh, for the medical expenses for her triple bypass surgery. Right. They didn't. She was made to pay the copay out of pocket. Um, they don't provide any medical, like they, they provided her no medical uh, insurance of any kind that's not provided for. It's not required to be provided for religious volunteers. They don't have to. Um, they're just getting work out of these people. So right. then at the same time, now she's dying up in this room and she just wants to get better. And she has in her mind, she's convinced if I can get on the bridge and I can get up the bridge and make it to clear, this is all going to be better. So John Bond's son is a gentleman named Emmett Bond. Um, who I think is out of the Sea Org now, but he was a reg at Asho. Uh, money, a, a money grubber. Yes. A money grubber. A reg, a money, a money reg collector. means registrar. Yes. <laughs> so that we're clear on this, anything that I am telling you, that I have two things. My mom is very meticulous. She has a ledger. She kept a ledger of every single financial transaction she ever made because she was so scared of getting in trouble with Scientology if she didn't pay all of the things I'm going to talk about. And I've been able to get every single page of her bank account and have compared every single transaction, every single check number, and I down to a penny. So on a Thursday before two, um, the amazing Emmett Bond comes up to her room, which is very great because she couldn't move and come and actually come to him at his office in Asho and gets her to write a check for $10,000 for auditing um, so that she can get better. Uh, they then decided to clean her up um, and get her that auditing because now that you've paid for it, there's two big statistics in these organizations. You have gross income. And then the other thing is you have paid completions. And if you've paid for stuff and you've completed something and they've actually like they've completed whatever they've sold you, they make money on it. So paid comps and gross income. Now she is part of the stats. So they cleaned her up. They fed her. Uh, and most of her auditing was assists and uh, locationals. Uh, and stuff. And uh, she started feeling good after she was uh, gotten outside into the fresh air. And she started feeling a little bit better after she ate and got a shower. And um, it was amazing. Let, so that's Mike, what she get for me, 10 grand. Let, let me just interrupt. Assists mm. and locationals are Scientology Hubbard, you know, auditing processes that are used uh, for, you know, like kind of anybody can do them. That's what volunteer ministers do. Right. Being Rosemary being being sold on you're going to get up the bridge to help you assists eh, and locationals do absolutely nothing. I know this is an arcane Scientology point, but this is not progressing up the bridge to the state of clear and OT. This is treading water that you've just paid for. Right. And and, and it's layer. This is the upon, free stuff you're supposed to be able to do. Yeah. On, and it's anybody. layer upon layer of fraud because as a C org as a member of the C organization, 
it, there's a whole area that sole responsibility is for taking care of the staff and seeing that they get the attention that they need. And she never should have paid a penny for anything, whether it be assists or counseling or anything, because she's a member all of the organization. Yes, or medical. Or medical. That's yes, all absolutely. Covered. Supposed absolutely. to be covered. So yes. this is the thing. When a person has now been in the Sea Org for the better part of their adult life, when they have nothing else to fall back onto, um, not only are they indoctrinated to like do whatever they're told, but they have no other options. And they also think that it's really like, like I asked her at some point, this is relevant. I'm like, what was your mindset about what was going on in the organization over all these years. She's like, I just thought it was a bad spurt that everything was going through. I thought it would get better at some point. I couldn't stand like all of the Dave stuff, but I, I thought that LRH, like his technology was the, like it's actually going to get better. And it's, you know, just like Claire, you mentioned in one of your videos, um, the days are long and the years are short. Yeah. So you just are like, if you can do, just don't quit today, just get through today, get through today, get through today. Before you know it, you've been there for years, Emma. for decades. Yeah. And, and and that's now, with systematic obliteration of any ability to think critically about the circumstance you're in, about what's mm -hmm. going on, about where things are headed, or any solution to the misery that is your life. Correct. So... So that was a frame of mind that she was in. <clears throat> and then um, at one point I was, I was down doing some training at another base, but she, I got a phone call from her and she's like, Michael, I have such great news. And I'm like, what is it, mom? She's like, well, two things. One, I'm able to qualify for uh, the secondary health insurance coverage, which is, you know, the state that covers all of your medical expenses when you have no money, um, which is for people that really do need it. It's a, it's a form of welfare. So there's Medicaid and Medi-Cal in California or, you, you know, Medicare in different States. And I'm like, well, that's great, mom. And she's like, yeah, and I'm getting auditing. I'm like, fabulous. Because I, I left, if she's happy to be in Scientology, I want her to be there. Like if you're a consenting adult and that's what you want to do, my mindset at the time, mom, I'm happy for you. And I, and I was, she was being able to tell me this and she said, yeah, she's like, I was just able to pay for it and go right to Asho. And I'm like, can you, what did you say? She's like, yeah, I paid for it. I went to Asho. I was able to write a check. I'm like, mom, how much did you write them a check for? And she's like, $10,000. And I'm like, what did you get? It's basically like their objective processing, like, you know, move shit around the room and like TR kind of stuff. Right. And I, at this time I had, you know, Miriam Powell and Mike Sutter trying to like, you know, get me cleaned up and back in. So I wrote to Mike Sutter a very, uh, probably poorly worded and offensive email and called him many choice words. Uh, and I said, by absolutely like you, you fucking criminals have taken a bunch of money from a little old lady. I'm like, how can you like, and he's like, we do a lot for people in the Purif. And I'm like, you're such an idiot. Um, so the result of me doing that was they knew she was communicating with me. So she yeah. was made to turn in her burner phone, Mike Sutter and all of the ethics people then down in, uh, and pack pulled her in and she was made to write up a full report on all of what my, like, tell us everything about your son and what happened and, you know, what's he doing and like, just, you know, getting interrogating for information, obviously OSA RTC trying to find out. So she still has a copy of this, but on the bottom of it, there were certain things that she wrote in there. Like when she said, Hey, you know, I was made to pay for certain things or do this. This is all Mike Sutter's handwriting were the report that she did was edited by him and you know and he and what to write in these things so even their internal reports are being restructured in such a way to make them like because she said some stuff that was like highly illegal you know of what they were doing <laughs> and they're like let's change this shit you know so we can so send it around which is just take all yeah. take all the illegal or illegal documentation yeah, out. turn it into code yeah mm -hmm. exactly uh or change the wording on it or remove these paragraphs and say it this way like Anyway, needless do. to say, I didn't hear from my mother for a very long time. Mm. Um, fast forward many, many deployments, many, many years, many, many children being born, um, and a lot of my life changing. And also me growing as an individual and also through this, the, the former Scientology movement started in large part by Mark 
Mike, Leah, all of this is now forefront in my mind. I've never had, because I've, I live not anywhere close to a Scientology facility anymore. All of my friend group, like this is like me remembering how to speak a former language. Right. Like I can talk, I, 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 I joined a different organization that is always also very high control, but it has its own way of saying things that are nothing like this anymore. Um, but I've had a wonderful life and I've uh, been able to move on from that point. And I just was at the point of just thinking I'd probably never hear from my mother again, or at some point I'd find out that she possibly passed away. I had no idea how to really solve that problem, but I also really didn't really, I didn't have anyone aside from, you know, calling friends on the phone every once in a while to really talk through these things with. So in 2021, uh, February, I get a, um, I get a phone call that she's basically uh, more or less on her deathbed in the hospital. And, um, I go out there and find, you know, and I start to kind of reconnect with her and there's part of this we're going to get into, I think, in probably our next video that we're going to do. Um, but eventually we're able to get her out of the situation, but I find out a lot of information to fill in the blanks between this whole section between, um, between uh, 2011 and 2021, this 10 year period, what had happened with her as an elderly Sea Org member. Yep. Um, and it took many years once we, I reconnected with her and we'll, and we'll save that for the next one we do. But I do want to go over this abuse so that we fully defined it as part of it, um, as, as it gets worse. And I know that what we've already gone over is pretty bad, but the fact that I wrote to Mike Sutter um, and I bitched and that an SP knows about uh, what I now know was the beginnings of or related to a financial strategy called the chase wave, um, which is uh, mainly was perpetrated by regs where they would be running up public Scientologists credit cards that they had on file for auditing and training services that they did not authorize. Or they would they would basically just be getting the GI up Thursday before two. They would make transactions that were not authorized on people's cards. Yep. Gross income, so, of course. <clears throat> the gross income. Um, the original understanding was this was something that was being done to the public. Um, and it was. And um, there's been a lot of community, there's been a lot of videos that have been done about what what happened and what was Scientology's reaction to that. They launched, you know, I think it was um, Jaeger and some other people down to pack in order to clean all of this up for this public Scientologist so that none of them would go to law enforcement and say, hey, they're stealing all of our money. Because right. what is Scientology most afraid of? Losing their tax exempt status. Why? Because then they're open to scrutiny and they can't keep hiding behind religious protections afforded in our constitution. And, but meanwhile, they're, they're doing illegal shit. <clears throat> so because I had bitched about her, um, the money being taken from her, she was kind of off the hook and wasn't messed around with until um, 2014. In 2014, by this point, she's actually probably just out of her social security payments. She's put away about the better part of uh, $25,000 plus just sitting in her account. Again, CRG members don't have a whole lot of expenses, but I'll frame the way that elderly people should plan for their retirement versus the way the CRG plans for retirement kind of at the end of this. So now she has this little nest egg of about $25,000. She is, uh, was, she was moved off of her job as the main mess cleaner and she was put in the advanced organization of Los Angeles. And this is where most, if there's any under the radar public Scientologists that are watching this right now who have ever between 2011 and 2021 done an extension course at the advanced organization of Los Angeles, Rosemary was your extension course supervisor. During COVID, when nothing but extension courses were being done, Rosemary and here's a picture of her, was the person that was grading your extension courses. I will now proceed to explain to you how these elderly Sea Org members live and what they do with their financial money or what the organization does with it. Her um, living conditions at this time, she was in a room. Um, it was, I think, room um, 206 of the main building. 
And this was an old mechanical room that had been converted. It was on the second floor because it was a little bit easier for the old people to get to. A lot of times they had to use the steps because the elevators weren't always working or available. So it was at least easier for them to walk up steps and stuff. There was an old mechanical room. It didn't have any windows in the room. There wasn't any ventilation in it. So they all pulled their money together and actually got like an, uh, an HVAC uh, heating and cooling unit and poked a hole in the wall and stuck the vent of it in the elevator shaft. Wow. Um, they, they slept on bunk beds because that's what you do with old people. Um, she was one of the younger old people, um, between the age of 65 and seventies. There were, there were ladies in there that were into their nineties and, uh, some of them had bottom bunks. Some of them didn't, And how there many, wasn't anyone really, sorry, how many elderly women were in this room? Um, let's see there. She's. So it was two separate rooms together in this room where she was, was at least 12. Wow. And there wasn't like, it wasn't like they were in there with somebody caring for them. They're in there. Like they get off work when everyone else gets as an old person, you can usually get off work a couple hours earlier. So you're not getting home at 11. You're probably getting home at like nine o'clock, but they'd have to wash themselves. Um, they had, so in that picture that you saw, she had that nice blazer that she was wearing. The org would pay for your dry cleaning. And uh, so what you see here is her dry cleaning was done of the blazer, but her undergarments, her shirts, and all of the other things that she would wear, there was no mechanism for these old people to have their laundry done. So anyone who's been at PAC, you know that the laundry rooms um, are at the far other side of that complex area over, you know, on the other side of um, yeah. kind of adjacent to Lebanon Hall, Asho, and the PAC mill. There's a big area in there with a bunch of in, like commercial grade washing machines and you have to walk through hallways and across rooftops and all sorts of stuff in order to get to this freaking thing. And then you go in there and it's up a flight of stairs and then you're in there trying to wait for your laundry for an elderly person that has is post-op after heart surgery and realize after the heart surgery, she was not given medical follow-up. She did not have a cardiologist. She did not have a pulmonologist. She did not have regular doctor's checkups. Um, she was uh, experiencing all sorts of, you know, water retention. Uh, the MLOs would say, you need to take your medicine. Um, but then they're, they're shown like, Hey, we're supposed to take vitamins. You know, we're supposed to be scared of, you know, these medical miracles that the rest of the world takes advantage of because we don't want drugs and all this. Meanwhile, these people are just slowly dying or living like crap. No one would wash their clothes. So they would go months without their clothes being washed. Okay. Either that or they'd wash them in the sink. This is how they're living. So, and then they'd like go and they'd work. And, um, most of the time there's, there's a tunnel system underneath. And I know it sounds like all like, oh, there's a tunnel system. This isn't some QAnon thing. There's a tunnel system in the, uh, <laughs> uh pizzas. Anyway, um, there's a tunnel system underneath the complex that connects all of these orgs together. Yeah. So most of the time that, that serves two purposes. One, it's aesthetically pleasing to all the public because you don't have all of the staff members walking back and forth. And then two, it keeps them in the buildings more often. And then when you have suppressives around like picketing outside, they can just go through the tunnels. If they need to go from the main building over to AOLA or up to ASHO, there's, they can just go through the tunnels. So she would have to go through the tunnels. She didn't have an oxygen machine. She needs to be on supplemental oxygen. She has needed to be on that for years and never had it, but they would go just about their normal day. They'd go and they'd work. Then during their meal breaks, they'd have to make it over to the main mess through the tunnels go and eat, make it back for muster. This is her life every single day working them. So now we come to her money. She had $25,000 in her account. And I actually looked at the dates that this happened. This was, it started on a Tuesday and they had it completed on Thursday before two o'clock, um, which I'm really excited about it. Um, uh, good for them. So this is the International Association of Scientologists. This is the basically the war chest of Scientology where they collect up a bunch of money and they have it for all their legal battles. And they always say that they're doing all these, you know, benefits for the world and all this stuff, but it's basically a big slush fund for money that people donate to. Right. She was pulled in by uh, one of their senior registrars, uh, a guy named um, Bregan. Um, Teddy. Ted Bregan. Yep. Ted yep. Bregan and the Complete commanding officer. And not a criminal. Yeah, he's a total piece of shit. Um, but he was pulled in, uh, pulled in Rosemary. Um, 
And uh, also along with Teddy was the commanding officer of AOLA. Again, she is in the public division down here as a little, you know, uh, lowly Supervisor. person. Yeah. Right. And she was then um, kind of approached by this Ted Bragan and Salaj Padva to get her to donate to the IAS because they wanted, they needed some thing that they needed her to donate to. And they locked her in a room and tried to love bomb her, bringing her cookies and t-shirts and all a bunch of shit she doesn't need. They would not let her out of that room, you know, like beating their fists on the table. We have to stop the SPs until she agreed to give her money up. Now, again, she doesn't necessarily think she has need for money and she, their hard sell reg tactics she she just needs to get back to work like she needs to get her stats up before two or she's going to be in trouble she agreed to give them all that money so oh. she wrote checks they took it out of her account in 5k increments because they couldn't do the whole twenty thousand uh all at once but over the course of the next uh they basically over the course of the next couple of days they got all that money out wham big stats for the week um now wow. she's out of money <clears throat> so she is told to hey uh she was told at this point we need to get you some auditing so at, at AOLA, she was under a guy named Carlos Colon, and uh, he was in the the Div 6 public part of um, AOLA, wanted her to go up to LA Day and talk to them about getting some auditing. And she's like, okay, um, fine, I'll do that. So she walks her little way all the way up there, sits down with these regs, and this was a team of regs, and I'm definitely doing some name dropping because these people are the ones that law enforcement specifically needs to talk to. And there's a lot of them. So these people, uh, these uh, regs were Sherry Bloomfield, uh, Jackson Walker, and Joe Foss. Um, three on one against a little old lady. And she she basically said, I don't know why you're asking. They, they weren't trying to give her auditing. They were trying to reg her for auditing. And she's like, I just gave all my money to the IS. I have no money. And... Um, and then she was then she was refusing to cooperate. They're like, well, we can probably work some credit somehow and, you know, work this out. So there was another guy that then pulled her in when she wasn't cooperating with that named Jason Hemphill. Jason Hemphill is a heavy hitter that works for Miscavige. At this point, he was the commanding officer of the PAC base. So they have the commanding officer of the PAC base that I don't know exactly what that's supposed to be. I don't know if it's in CLO or what that is. <laughs> Neither did he. <laughs> Neither did he, but he ever. because he, apparently he's sitting in a reg cycle, right? Like yeah, hey, but either exactly. way, he's one of the top ten probably executives Officer at stripes, that entire yeah. base. Yes. At and, the time, and, he was the top executive in PAC, only probably answerable to CMO. Yeah, yes. and what? And Correct. sorry, what? What year was this? And how old was Rosemary by this point? Just, just again for context. So, so for context, at this point, she is in her late sixties, and this is in December of twenty fourteen. Got it. Thank you. And she had no money. She's like, she's like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm out of money. And they're like, well, we, we just want your agreement to work something out. She said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. So she goes back to work. She's like, I have to get my stats up. So she goes back to work. So the next day I've checked the, her financials. It is 31 December, 2014. She got a call from Sherry Bloomfield congratulating her. Rosemary, we figured out a way to get you your auditing. We figured out a way to get the money. She's like, uh, uh, okay, I don't, I don't understand this. And the, she's like, yep, we got it all worked out. Uh, what we did is we found another guy. Uh, we were able to put it on his credit card. Uh, there was a, there's a kind, uh, a gentleman named Kareel Chang Gahuli. It's a, it's one of these dual last names. Um, but his father, I think is a rich artist, uh, from the Netherlands. Um, Gahuli and then he his other family was Chang. Anyway, Chang Gahuli. They ran up on Kareel Chang Gahuli's credit card without his knowledge fifty thousand dollars for auditing for Rosemary to do the bridge from the bottom up. Not to start from grade four, because we got to redo everything to do it from the bottom up. She was like, wait, what? And they're like, yep, you can just pay Kirill back and it'll work out fine. And Kirill's like, he, she didn't even know who he was before this happened. They just had his credit card information and ran it up and said, you need to talk to her. She's the one with the auditing. Wow. So they ran it up in his name. So now she has, there's this credit card and he had this unbelievably high balance available or, you know, credit available. And they, they, they maxed the thing out. They filled up, boom 
all of it, 50 grand right on that credit card. And then told Rosemary, you need to pay back Kirill. So now when she gets her social security payments, what does she do? She pays back Kirill. Every single time she gets, she gets money, she pays back Kirill. She's getting auditing. I mean, she didn't really want it, but she's getting it. And now, um, but now she's, uh, they got to still get her more auditing. So they finish uh, something and they're like, oh, used up all the auditing we need to get you more you didn't quite finish these grades so then uh do you do you guys remember mickey estrada golden air yes. productions oh, yeah. bongo drums Absolutely. Hey, bongo, bongo. Yep. anyway um mickey was on the rpf with rosemary so they were friends um and they uh ran up mickey's credit card for another 12 grand um and then there was another lady they did another credit card there were like three or four of these people they they kept charging their credit cards without their authorization that's or would what be I was moving ask. money around yeah that's what i was going to ask so in every instance not only did the person mm -hmm. whose credit card not know and not authorize it but neither did rosemary 100% right. criminal credit card fraud over and over and over again. Over and over again. But these people, it gets worse. I promise you it's going to get worse. And I don't know how it could, but trust me, stay with me. It's going to. So now over the next seven years, she is all of her $50 a week pay, all any money that she, she got some money from an inheritance when her mother died, any money that she got all went to paying these bills. But what happens when you finish your auditing, you need more. They didn't get it done, but now they finished with her at LA Day. Now we need to send her to ASHO. She needs to which get power one, and power one, plus. One which, building over. One building, one building over. over. They're, yeah. they're connected by the same tunnel. You just get off. <laughs> like when you're going through the Hogwarts Express, you get off like one station earlier than that, right? Yeah. So so they, they get done there. And um, now the scheme changes. So she shows up there to the reg. And uh, the reg there was a guy named Carrie Green. And said, okay, Rosemary, we already have everything uh, set up. It's already paid for. Congratulate. And of course, they're love bombing you. Yay. You're going to start. You finish something. You're going to start your next thing. And she's like, what? So they had her go on to, it's it's basically like if you don't go clear, I guess, and whatever. Anyway, whatever. They had her do this power processing stuff. She's like, I don't understand what any of this is. When I say like, what was it? She's like, I don't even get it. Um, but what they did this time, again, what do you do when you join the Sea Org? You have to do this life history form. What does it consist of? Literally everything about your life, your financials, you name it, it's in there. Uh, your social name. security, mother's maiden name, social security number, date of birth, location of birth, of childhood, all of your childhood best yeah. friend, all of that. You name it. They have all of it. And they still have it for all of us, I'm convinced. You oh, know, I like, know they no do. doubt. They keep all of that shit. So they have all that stuff. So what they had done is they just opened up a, a 12,000. Uh, dollar discover card in her name and just charged it boop and now this is where it gets worse and um so this happened at and and now what they're doing is the the tactic has changed so between asho and aola they're bouncing her back and forth trying to get her to go clear um meanwhile she's disconnected from a suppressive you know me they're never going to let her on the ot levels claire would would they let rosemary on the ot levels even if she disconnected Definitely from me not. No, it's all, I mean, you and, have layer upon layer of reasons that they would just never approve that. She'd had open heart, heart right. um, you know, triple bypass surgery, the whole thing with well, Ronnie, she probably was an illegal, let her on. She was probably an illegal PC anyway. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She doesn't they, even qualify they were for all the never, crap. never, ever going to let her on, which is. But what she was, was an easy vehicle to get um, credit card, credit cards taken out in her name. Right. So now she has all this debt that's now it's piled up that she still hasn't paid off Kirill Changahuli, Mickey Estrada, like all of this stuff. It's not only paying them off, but now she's paying off. Like at one point she's like, Hey, I think I paid everything off. And Kirill's like, no, there's still $11,000 left on her from all the interest from the last five years. Like, okay, I'm going to start paying on the interest now. Like not really even understanding how that works, but she had to pay the interest and everything. So now wow. she has debts to CRG members that they ran up their credit cards, individual credit cards, and they went from Discover card, they have a Chase Slate card, they opened up three Navy Federal cards, and this is how they'll do it. The Reg has all of your information. They will then put in a credit, they will log on and do an online credit application. The creditors also know all of this and they know what Scientology is up to. And like they that's probably why they're turning off their their accounts for being able to uh, charge stuff there. But anyway, they will then say, for instance, a CRG member. And I have all of the credit applications for this. Hey, her um, 
her annual income is $60,000. She owns a house free and clear. She has no debts and she's applying for credit. Approved, $20,000 credit card. Next credit card. Now she makes $70,000 a year but it's like she does, she's not responsible for housing and they just in keep increasing the numbers to keep getting you more credit cards. So the, the, the only reason a credit card company will give you a credit card is if you are a good, if you're a good financial risk, meaning I can offer you a credit card. I know that you're going to pay me back and then some, and you have enough assets that if you die, I can take your assets away from you. Like right. when you die, it doesn't dissolve that credit card. What all your stuff basically goes into an estate and it gets divvied up to all of your, everybody you owe money to. And then that's how normal people, how, how their credit cards are dissolved after they pass. Right. For a CERG member that has no actual, it's nothing but debt and they have no actual physical, tangible resources, a house, a car, a 401k, any of that stuff, uh, a retirement pension, if it doesn't exist and that's all fake, that the banks are issuing credit and then the second somebody passes away, the bank has to eat that loss. And they don't realize that that's what's happening when Scientology does this. And they, they, this is not unique to Rosemary. No. Like she was in this room with all of these other women and they would all be getting like credit card statements from Navy Federal Credit Union and from Chase and from Discover. One lady, her name was um, Rose Marie Paquette. Rose Marie had passed away. And because Rosemary and Rosemary have such a similar name, Rosemary ended up getting some of her mail and her stack of Navy Federal Credit Union stuff coming in uh, for her to open. So she opened up this and she's like, oh, this is Rosemary's. Rosemary had died like the month before and she still had $12,600 owed to Navy Federal Credit Union. Wow. Rosemary like calls Navy Federal like, hey, my friend's dead. I just want to let you know. It's like, okay, thanks. So there, there's a list that we've made of about three dozen elderly Sea Org members between the, the properties around that complex. And this is why I'm happy to blow the lid off of this thing. The only way things in Scientology change is when you make a huge international stink about them online and yep. then things will get better. So maybe they'll stop embezzling money from old people. Maybe they'll give them some care, help them wash their clothes, take better care of them and stop actually abusing them. Maybe they'll help them actually put away for their retirement or put them in a decent place. Because right now you have CERG members that work for nothing. And, and the only reason I understand this better now is because I've now had to deal with my mother not having these things available. We all go through life accumulating wealth or a retirement or something that we can then fall back on once we get into our elderly years. You then take and liquidate your house, you sell it, you go into a retirement community and you kind of downsize down to the point where you're then getting care. But all of that comes from your life's work. These people have nothing. So Scientology will literally use them up until the day they die on post or they'll, or they'll kind of ship them off to some place that is like extremely substandard and hope they die soon. During this time, they're not getting medical care. She wasn't on supplemental oxygen that she needed, not getting like the doctor's um, visits that she needed for follow-up care or just normal care. She, she hadn't been to a dentist in years, like since Bob Horn was doing the shit at the Ant Ranch. Or sorry, not the Ant Ranch, but the Ant Base. Like the, yeah. the in-house dentist. The entire time in the RPF, none of that, nothing. No, no, no dental. Like, so, so now we find out about all this and it's like when I, when I, I started just documenting it, I just had folders and just calling, you know, like was able to get a power of attorney that overwrote the power of attorney that Scientology MLOs had for her so that I'm able to help her with her finances, yeah. get all this stuff out and say, mom, what is this stuff? Like, what are these charges? And she's like, oh, I completely forgot about that. I'm like, okay, well, when did this happen? Let's piece it together. What happened? Just go through it. Her memory is still amazing, but her body is broken. Um, and that's what happens when you're not going to be taken care of properly. Right. So this is, you know, the total amount, and this is, this is pretty impressive. I have to give it to them, all these regs. So, um, I'm going to, I'm just kind of going to help dime out a couple more guys there at AOLA. So Perfect. when she yes, was at please. AOLA, oh, yeah. So name some, away, <laughs> name away. I, I've yes. got so the list, she, Mike, I'm going to put it on my blog. I'm going to put Perfect. the list of names of these registrars on my blog. These so are financial when she was criminals who financial who, criminals. Yeah. Who take uh, Yeah. And they know it. And, and many of them are out 
a lot of them are running from the law and they're trying to figure out what to do. I have um, advice for you. Make a deal with the FBI. Um, so anyway, that's the best advice I could provide. All right. Yeah. So when she was at AOLA, she was under a guy named um, Michael Kerner. He was in charge. He was the executive over the public uh, division. Michael Kerner was one of these guys that opened up credit cards in her name. He did it under the guise of like, let me help you consolidate all this debt into a credit card that has 0% interest, which it did for like 90 days. And then it went up to like an unbelievably high interest rate. But not only that, once it was open and he opened several in her name and, and some of them didn't even have the right name on them. Like her name's Rosemary, but they made it as Rose M chick walk. Like, like she had like Rose and then Mary was her middle name. Like, it's like, wait, this is even fucked up. Like you didn't leave. They didn't read the life history correctly. They messed up there. Um, or, so, or they were intentionally doing that to get more credit and hopefully that it wasn't hitting. Maybe. Right, yeah. Uh, credit yeah. Report. It, maybe it was getting through. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the amount of this credit is staggering. Um, there was another time where uh, there, one of the regs there, uh, a kid named Derek Myers, uh, Derek, Derek Myers was Myers actually married to Stacey. Derek Myers used to be married to Stacy Myers. Stacy Myers. Stacy Moxon. Stacy Moxon. She's the one who had the uh, the electrocution event up at the end base. Right. Yeah. Um, she unalived and, herself, and it was covered up by Scientology. And correct. Derek was married to her at that time. In Derek fact, that, was married to her at the time. It was a big piece of why she was depressed because she was working at the headquarters and he was working in LA and she never saw him. But yeah, sorry, off topic. No, for this. But, it, <laughs> but it's funny how small the, how small really the group is. of these people is. So at the time when this happened, Rosemary was at Golden Era Productions as the G's housekeeper. Stacy gets electrocuted. Stacy dies. Derek is brought up to Int in order to get some auditing and make sure that he's not a risk she, she, yeah, Derek stayed at the G's and Rosemary took care of Derek, had no wow. idea who he was or that she, or that Derek was connected with Stacy. But now Derek is down in AOLA and now she knows Derek because Derek is a tours reg and was able to get the credit card numbers. And when he was out on tour, I guess, wasn't good on GI. So he's like charging up her accounts, trying to do more stuff. $5,000 here, 10 grand here, like through these credit cards that she's trying to pay down. He's still like doing this stuff. Wow. She brings this up to the flag banking officer. They get some credit card, like, like some of the transactions canceled. Like it's, it's all just, they're, they're just scrambling and eating their own, trying to make GI is what they're doing with their old people that, Anyway, this is happening. So Derek is there. What What's funny is most of these regs have now been gotten rid of, but Derek is still there. Hmm. Derek is still there and still on the same post. And I think that they're going a similar route, um, Mike, and what they're probably doing with Benjamin, trying to keep him happy because he probably had this, like the the fact that he's tied in with something so legally sensitive um, as right. Stacey's event. Yeah. He, they, he, anyway. They that's don't want conjecture, Derek but Meyer that's the way I see speaking it. Speaking about anything oh. about what Stacy told him. And his hands are dirty with all this financial shit, too. Right. So, Derek, when you're out on tour, bro, and you see this, I want you to uh, think about what you're going to do because you should hop the fence and make a deal with somebody. Yep. Um, anyway, so all told on all of these things, um, the total amount of money that was extorted from Rosemary that she then had to pay to the IS um, for auditing straight up or uh, to other CRG members whose credit cards were run up and she then had to pay them back or for credit card so that were opened in her name without her consent and she was then made to pay them back was over $163,000. That's, that's while they're paying her $50 a week. And the $50 a week is going towards paying those bills. Un freaking believable. And then, uh, so this is the life that she's living and, uh, kind of going back to her medical condition, she was very unwell in that she wasn't getting the proper care. She should have been on heart medication. Um, she should have had a lot of uh, care that she was not getting and also been on supplemental oxygen. She wasn't. So she ended up with extremely bad pneumonia and her O2 is tanking like just super low. And she was like, was able to get, a, this is some late night after working, able to get a hold of another old lady that's an MLO assistant. And they drive, and this is 
2021 during COVID, they end up driving her over to Hollywood Presbyterian that is a block away from the main building uh, and dropped her off in the emergency room and she was admitted in there and they thought she was going to pass. Wow. And yeah. really all she had is she had extreme dehydration um, and the pneumonia was to the point where it was, you know, her lung function was vastly degraded and um, she was unresponsive. So they thought she had a stroke. She didn't have a stroke. She was just that hy uh, hypoxic from, you know, the pneumonia. So she was unconscious for uh, the better part of a week. I ended up finding out about this and I flew out to LA and um, we thought she was going to pass again. I was in there and uh, talking, you know, she was starting to come to a little bit because now she was getting medication. The uh, They were starting to get the pneumonia under control. She was on the oxygen, starting to come around. We're helping her eat. Um, so it was going in and out of hospitals during COVID was kind of crazy. Anyone that had to do it, they, you know what I'm talking about. It's like, it's hard to get in and you can only stay for a certain amount of time. But one of those times we were in there, now the, one of the MLOs, they have two MLOs for PAC. They have, uh, Adrian Amberon, uh, now Pavlov, and they have Barbell Light, which was David Light's, um, wife, uh, before yeah. he passed. Uh, it's and actually Valerie's, I think, um, mother-in-law. Yeah. And former. by MLO, anyway. we mean medical liaison officer, which means- yes, thank you. Absolutely nothing because they have zero medi <laughs> medical qualifications. It's literally just a staff member who is there to make sure the person, you know, that they know yeah. what, what's going on. Claire, They're not you're there the to help. Now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I just want to make, I just want to make clear because we refer to them as medical officers. They are not. They're not. Yeah. They're not nurses. They're not doctors. No. So while I was there, Barbell, and it's a weird name, but she's German. Um, she came in and gave um, Rosemary what they would refer to as the final CS. Um, Claire, you probably know what that means. It's when a person yep. is expected to pass away, right? Yeah. So it's, a, it's put it in layman's terms. They're basically giving you a consultation or giving you a command of what you need to do next. And I'll let you. We'll just yeah. So she comes simple. in and says, the CS wanted me to give you an R factor, which is their code for the a senior uh, technical person in Scientology that looks over your particular counseling, wanted me to tell you that you are authorized to drop your body, meaning you are okay to now leave and die. Um, and I was sitting there, I was like, I'm like, and it, what was funny, there was two things were funny. One, that somebody could say it like that to somebody and two, um, mom's reaction at the time, she was like, okay, like, I, like they're so used to just being told to do stuff. It was like, anyway. Um, so at this point she's now in the hospital and, uh, we thought she was going to pass and she was basically between the intensive care ward and, uh, a rehab floor for the better part of 30 days in that hospital before she was moved into a hospice facility by them. Uh, they moved her into a hospice facility and this is probably a point we could probably branch off for any, any questions or if we wanted to end. Um, but they moved her into a hospice facility in Glendale that is, was, wasn't a very nice place, but it was being paid for by AOLA advanced organization, Los Angeles. The reason why they did that is not necessarily for the betterment of the person. And I want to make sure that this is really clear because it's specific. So they moved her into a hospice facility because they were scared she was going to die on their premises. And she was now a risk to have on in their dorms yeah. because if someone dies and they had somebody that, and she has a story that I can get into at another time, had a story of somebody that was dying and they quickly, like they didn't call 911 to get EMTs. It took about 45 minutes for somebody to round up a car and they dropped them at the ER and the person died by themselves in the hospital. Um, this is an old lady that was 92 years old. She worked until the day she died and they just dumped her off. So um, uh, it's, they it's, don't want you on the property so if you're old yeah, and if you're dying. No. Yeah. yeah. And just so. as a, as a comment. So when that, when that statement was given to Rosemary telling her to drop the body, it's essentially a command like, and so I'm just so thankful, Rosemary, that you didn't. <laughs> she is watching <laughs> by the way. <laughs> We're, we're very glad you didn't. Uh, I'm glad you're too stubborn to listen to them at least once. So <laughs> anyway. Go, Rosemary. <laughs> so um, now the, the story after this is a story of how a person is put into 
Um, put into hospice, expected to die, hoped to die, and how she was able to deprogram herself and reach back out to family, get in contact with me, and realize that she was pretty much like sleeping with the enemy and needed out of there and had no way to do so. So, and then that, and then in the next part of this is when we're going to talk about it. This is where Mike and Claire become extremely instrumental and um, we're able to get her um, not only the care, but also uh, hooked up with legal representation and things of this nature. But I'm going to, I'm just going to like say it, Claire, because you deserve some kudos without Claire and her efforts in the Aftermath Foundation, Rosemary would have died in that hospice facility. Uh, the the Aftermath Foundation, it's not just some catchphrase. It's not just something to tease Dave Miscavige about because he can't take care of his old people. The, the Sergio Belinsky documentary is a real person that's being helped. Everything that I've told you about Rosemary is a real person, a real elderly person, of which most of the Sea Org population is aging out. And they're in a situation where they're not being properly cared for. Rosemary is one of at least three dozen other people just that she knew in that area that are in the same situation. And Claire worked tirely with us, tirelessly with us in order to not only make sure that we had what we needed when we had it, but you were always a phone call away. No matter, no matter the time of day or night, it was like you were a text away. Hey, Claire, can I call you? It wasn't like, oh, I'm, I'm sure you stepped out from many a thing. And I just want to say how absolutely appreciative I am of you and all of your efforts and everything that everyone that contributes to this foundation, they are doing work that is making a difference for real people that are saving their lives. That's not some bullshit cat's phrase. This is 100% true. So, um, well, just thank, thank you. you, Mike. And thank you for being there. And of course we have an amazing board, at, you know, Mike Rinder, Christy, Mark, Aaron, you know, we, but yes, this is our passion to help people and we have, we are gaining momentum and it was, it's completely our honor to be able to help with situations like this. And we appreciate so greatly that you reached out to us to let us help with this. And, and I know I just want to add something to this, Mike, because mm -hmm. your, your, um, understandably not talking about what you really did yeah and honestly if like the aftermath foundation and my involvement in this and claire's involvement in this would never have happened without you you were the person who got your your face in their faces and your inserted yourself into this equation and took took the action that so many other people have not taken for whatever reason of putting your foot down and saying the fuck this is what's going to happen no this is not how this is going to go down this is how this is going to go down and you i mean you saved rosemary's life as much as the aftermath foundation did because there was nothing that we would have been able to do had we not had you there to begin with. And then you, like, as we'll get into working with Rosemary to educate her on what really happened to her and yeah, that was how hard. she had yeah. been victimized because victim is a, is a pejorative term in Scientology. And mm -hmm. nobody ever wants to be called a victim, even though they are victimized constantly. And the elderly are being victimized more than anyone at this point. This, this I said at the beginning, Rosemary exemplifies what is happening to a lot of people. You say she knows three dozen herself. There are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds at this point, who are in mm -hmm. this position in the C organization being abused, maybe not exactly like Rosemary, but Rosemary encapsulates the attitude and view of Scientology and the C org about what, how do we deal with these aging C org members who've given. 
20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of their lives to us now that mm -hmm. they can't work anymore. Now that they're not uh, slave labor resources. Oh, they'll uh, work though. All, all we can right. do is suck mm -hmm. anything left out of them, use the fact that they have perhaps social security to secure credit cards so we can run up their credit cards and when they die, we're off the hook, but we got all their money. There's stories of like one lady has dementia, like she's not in her right mind anymore. She gets $500 a month from like her late husband, like left it to her as part of like she got his pension. The IS red shows up every week or every month when she gets the money and she just signs it over to him and she isn't even able to clean herself. Like she, she doesn't put on her clothes right and she's just signing money away. Like this is, this is, they're going to stop doing it because it's like, oh my gosh, there's this big flap and there's this SP, Mike Brown, that's <laughs> like, I'll be honest with you people. Like the total amount of fucks that I give about Scientology is very, very insignificant. Like <laughs> if people want to be in Scientology, have at it. But this right. is where I draw the line. And I think it was Gandhi that said the true measure of any society is how it treats its most vulnerable members. The way that they treated us as children, the lawsuits that exist against trafficking of children, the way that, and I'll get into the stuff at the ranch um, and other interviews, that's bad. The way that they are currently treating their elderly CERG members, the fact that they don't have an, like a, a strategy, like even if they had like, you know what, we need to find out some like, hey, we're not using the gold base because we got Scientology media productions. Let's make a nice facility and properly like take care. Of it. They never will. And this is the problem with Scientology. There's one problem with Scientology, and it's if you're a hammer, everything is a nail there. They are not able to adapt or overcome to anything other than just what they have to do all the time. And it's just like you're just driving down the road. No matter what's happening, you're just running over stuff. And you're like, I don't know why this is happening. Right. It's ridiculous. So. Yeah, it's a lot, but yes, there is. Uh, but would I want to share the story again? Like I, I care not about Scientology and uh, its content, but and I never planned on coming back into this conversation. To be honest with you, like I kind of put it behind me, and people can have their their view about my my decision to do that at the time. But when I found out about this level of abuse, I had to insert myself back into it, and they have created yet another person that's speaking out about this stuff, not because I'm bad. I'm if they want to call me bad, that's cool. I've been called worse, but um, I'm just telling you what happened. Like right. I have, if anyone wants to see it, I got all of her financials. I have her little book. I have the credit card applications. I have every check number. Like this isn't me drumming up. <clears throat> like I have better shit to do with my time, but this is important to do. So I'm going to make time to do it. So, yes. Anyway. And we will we will be doing our next we Aftermath will. Foundation documentary, The Story of Rosemary Chickwalk, where we will go into this in great detail. But of course, uh, your time is is valuable. Rosemary's time is valuable. And we just wanted to take this opportunity to shine a very bright light where it needs to be shone immediately. But yes, so I think is our plan to take some questions and then conclude part oh. one and resume part two. I don't, I don't know about questions, Claire. This is okay. an hour and 48 minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was a lot. I Maybe appreciate can, you and, sticking and in with me been, on this. Mike has been, been uh, talking. Uh, look, there's two things I want to say. One, I think that we should t take questions. We're going to resume on Thursday, same time, and finish this story because it's important to finish it. Yes. Seems like okay. a good place to stop here. I Sounds just good. want everybody to know Rosemary is okay. She's not in the Sea Org anymore. We got her out of the Sea Org. It was one of the great, this was one of the great coups of all time. We'll tell you all about it on Thursday, mm -hmm. how that went down, who was involved in it. It's pretty kind of exciting. Pretty well, and then what happened after that and the legal matters and all sorts of stuff that we have yet to get into but please rest assured rosemary is being taken care of she is with mike and her grandchildren and you know daughter-in-law and um it's not she's happy and safe 
Yes. She she, lo happy. she she loves People Puzzler. You can tell uh, Leah All that right. is one of her favorite shows. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe and we this... can yeah end end today's episode at least showing the the current picture of her. Is that okay? I will. I okay. will. But one other thing I wanted to say. I there was a comment in there earlier about how you need to be on SPTV, Mike. You need your own YouTube channel. And I made a comment saying, well, he's got one now. It's new. He had two followers as of whatever it was, four o'clock this afternoon. But So I started yesterday with one follower. A follower was my uh, beautiful wife, Emily. Um, and then um, and then I let you all know about it. And I, then I got two followers. So I'm an affluence highest ever. I'm, and uh, I'm by, two. by the time we started, I had four. Four. <laughs> nice. Okay. But people are going, <laughs> so where, what are you, what is the name of your channel on YouTube? Because you get a whole bunch more followers right away yes. if you can remember what it is, Mike. I can. Um, so again, it's just, uh, and it's really, I'm, I'm not as much of a content creator at this point. Maybe at some point it'll make sense for me to be. Um, but I do have a YouTube channel and I plan on at least uploading these things to that and, you know, continuing to tell the story. And I'll probably end up having uh, some additional um, content in there that it will be with, um, with my mom as well. So it'll be us, you know, interacting and actually let her tell her story a bit as well. But it's at, let me see if I get this right at Mike Brown, um, one zero one. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> we will find out. I like, found in, it. In I found it. Two seconds. She found it. You're going to put right. those in. I subscribed. Yeah, like, <laughs> done. See, I, it says I escaped Scientology many years ago, forced that's to start my life from scratch. There we go. Boom. Okay. So I'm going to show a picture and you're, now. You're already at 18 subscribers now, Mike. Uh, 40. Hey, go you're at here. 40. 40. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Thank you to everybody listening to us and doing what we ask. This, uh, this. And by the way, if anybody here has not subscribed to Blown for Good or my channel, uh, Get your butt in gear and subscribe and like and do all that stuff you're supposed to be doing. Okay, here is a picture. Uh, I don't know when you took this, Mike, recently. Uh, right? It was a few months. It was shortly after we uh, got her out of L.A. So you can see, okay. you know, that she she's probably mortified that I showed this picture. She's, I know. She's like, but... oh, I don't have my hair done. But she <laughs> is, um, we got, she's in a very comfortable space. She's in an excellent care facility. Uh, they have lots of life enrichment um, things that she's able to interact with. One thing I found out about my mother, she is an amazing artist. I never knew that. Like she just started doing, giving me these doodles of the grandkids. And I'm like, mom, these are really good. She's like, yeah, I used to draw when I was a little girl. Was like, wow. wow. So she's, she's very, she's very well taken care of. She's very happy. And uh, she's also very excited uh, that all this is happening. So it's, it's a lot for her. Um, I'm kind of, going to try to represent uh her story as best i can but i also don't want to put her in the situation of having to do that if i do anything with her there'll be some pre-recorded videos that'll be kind of topical um, right but i think that she also just she just needs she needs to live her life and like have a chance to just relax and if she wants to watch people puzzler or she likes cash cab a lot too but anyway she can do that <laughs> until her until she's ready to go to bed. You know what I mean? Yes, so, right. that's amazing. We, Beautiful. We, we love you, Rosemary. We love We're, you, Rosemary. Mike's going to Mike... give you a big hug from both of us. We love you so, so much. We're so grateful you're here. And thank you, Mike, for for just being there for her and being an amazing son. And it's, it's just an incredible thing. Right. Thank you and so much. You have done a, a wonderful and remarkable job of representing Rosemary here and representing what is good and honest and forthright and full of empathy about those who speak out about the abuses of Scientology. Yeah. You're like a you're like a, a great example of so many people now who are taking the opportunity to tell their truth about what really goes on in the world of Scientology. And you've just done the whole world a big service. And we will see everybody on Thursday evening at the same time to finish the story and 
um, maybe take some questions from people. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I mean, yeah. there's a, I'm down there's a lot to. to this story. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm open for questions if people have them. Awesome. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you for everybody who has watched all the way to this time. Uh, we're going to say goodbye now, and I will click on my little outro thingy that is out of date um, just so we have an ending to this video. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>